Susan. I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, our chair, Leo Vidigal. Obrigado, David. É, gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos né, nessa segunda, no segundo dia do, do Sound System International, excepcionalmente virtual. Né? Agradecer também aos integrantes da mesa que estão aqui comigo. É, eu sou Léo Vidigal, professor da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, integrante do Descarreg Sound System. Estou aqui para mediar a mesa de hoje. Ontem tivemos uma fantástica plenária de abertura com o Wayne Marshall, e hoje teremos quatro pesquisadores de quatro estados brasileiros, né, de quatro estados diferentes do Brasil. São Paulo, Minas Gerais, Maranhão e Pará. Para a mesa que se chama Radiolas, Aparelhagens e Favela Hi-Fi. Favela Hi-Fi, Sound System Culture in the Brazilian Context. We talk about sound system from the approach of four different knowledge areas, occupational therapy, music, social communication and anthropology. So definitely this will be a very interesting panel. So I would like to start out by giving the floor to Luisa Ribeiro da Silva from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, who will be the first one to show her panel called Sound System Culture in Sao Paulo Youth Peripheries, Resisting Invisibility and Enlarging Circuits. So I'll give the floor to Luisa so that she can start with her presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, if you're on the other side of the world. Thank you for the introduction, Leo and David. Like has been mentioned, my name is Luisa Ursuba, that's my nickname. I'm uh, with uh, Sao Paulo University. I did my undergraduate degree there in occupational therapy. And now I'm in the School of Medicine of the University of Sao Paulo doing my master's degree in social inclusion processes. I did this research, I said myself and my partner, Marta Cavalho de Almeida, who was my teacher in my undergraduate course, and now she's my advisor in my master's course. It was really nice because I had no knowledge of what, uh, she had no knowledge of what this culture was, so she, got to learn along with me because, you know, we always have something else to learn, you know? So that was a long process, many years of learning, of discoveries, and it was very nice. It's a research which has this title, Sound System Culture and the Young People from the Ghettos of Sao Paulo, Resisting Invisibility and Enlarging Circuits. It's a research contextualized in the city of Sao Paulo, which is where I live. I come from the state of Minas Gerais, but I came to Sao Paulo and I ended up facing this culture, which uh, I had no knowledge about at first. I didn't know about it, and at, as time went by, I, I was able to name it. So let me make a brief introduction of this research. It's, it's gigantic, actually. It's quite large, but it contributes with a new perspective on some systems, which I believe when we increase the, uh, broaden the discussion, we also potentialize the sound system culture. So that's why I believe it's very nice the work you have been doing with these international symposia. It really uh, brings about discussion and that's very important. Currently, I work as an occupational therapist at an inclusive residence, which is a public policy service for, uh, that we have in Brazil which is a service for institutionalized housing for youngsters and adults who have uh, uh, social situations of uh, invulnerability. So my main role in this uh, discussion is to articulate the uh, social participation of these users. So I start by saying where I am because that bugs out people's minds. You know, how did this uh, health-related girl uh, come about, you know, talking about the Saragian sound system culture. And it's interesting because I bring about an intersectoral perspective to this discussion, I believe. So, this is a question. Uh, how come this girl from health is talking about reggae? I will talk about my education and I will, uh, you know, I have to read a bit so, to, as to organize my talk. Uh, as an occupational therapist, my main objective study is the everyday activities 
of different populations. And in my everyday activities, I work with young people with uh, uh, disabilities, but transversal to all of these fields, we have the issue of inequality, access to rights, uh, social situation, which invalidates subjectivities and aims at confining bodies and ends up not recognizing certain populations as producers of meaning. And that helps both in my professional practice as a, prof as a occupational therapist and in the context of reggae, which is transversal to these two areas. My job as an occupational therapist is to break away, always with partnerships because nobody does anything alone, break away from the structure, promoting the desire for difference and favoring the experimentation of other social spaces by the population I follow, which is something that could only happen from a concept of care that is given with freedom and within the territory. And I normally say that uh, to the sound of a lot of reggae, something similar has already been happening in the city of Sao Paulo in some ghettos with or without the presence of an occupational therapist or not. Things happen regardless of this research. <clears throat> now we talk a bit about the context of Brazil. It's no mystery that Brazil is, is one of the most unequal countries in the world. The inequality here is very marked. And ghettos, uh, there are many researchers uh, studying ghettos, but along the decades, they have been labeled as places where everything is lacking, right? Everything is missing. There's also always everything missing there. And the sound system culture in opposition to this social assumption indicates that there are cultural movements articulated by young people that come from this territory that comes from the same context and propagates counter hegemonic values and denounce inequalities, thereby strengthening their peers at every new meeting. So, in addition to this concept of this uh, social assumption that attributes to the ghettos situations of lacking resources, lacking access, uh, we also have cultural movements that show the power of these territories as well. And then, in my research, I considered Boaventura de Souza Santos, uh, Paulo Freire, and Milton Santos. Milton Santos, Paulo Freire are Brazilian, and Boaventura is a Portuguese sociologist. They also talk about the disputes between the North and the South in the, in the globe, you know. There's also these disputes between them. There's a dispute between the North and the South, areas of the globe and in these disputes we end up hiding the world from the world itself in other words we end up wasting a wealth of social experiences because we end up believing that the world is only what we can see which in, rea in reality there are so many different experiences that are not included in the dominant discourse and so my intuit my intention is to declare the sound system to strengthen the protagonists and the territory where this happens. So, uh, based on this perspective, I have sought to declare the sound system culture as something that in addition to existing, also provokes the reality that we know, thereby allowing other narratives from those who live in these ghetto territories. So, I have been working on this research for the last six years, you know, I was just going around the city of Sao Paulo, downtown, etc. And then I faced a different kind of party that would play a different kind of music. Nice, you know, I took in that information and went around town. And at, when I saw that at a different place in town, I saw something similar and I started to think, wait, there's got to be a name for this, you know? There's got to be a name and I don't know that name. So I started, you know, joining the culture. My approximation at first was as a simple participant because I started liking the culture. And then I found out that that was called reggae sound system culture. And as I participated, I noticed that there was something beyond the culture, you know, that there was something beyond the music that allowed for the protagonism of uh, 
yeah, black people from the ghettos in town. So I, you know, I brought this into the academic field. So in these six years, I had the opportunity of check out sound systems from all over Brazil because Sao Paulo, the sound system culture is very strong here. So many people from other states come to, to perform here. So I've seen sound systems from several places in Brazil and also from abroad. I had the opportunity to spend some time and share inf uh, information in Europe as my education uh, uh, period. And also I got close to European sound systems. I noticed several differences, context is everything really. And also I, I know sound systems of in Brazil of women, men and women, only whites, only blacks, the first, the first uh, presentation of some the 30th presentation of others, you know, I participated in many moments of the culture. And from that, I built on my research and I got together with selectors and selectresses from four some system collectives in the city of Sao Paulo, which really helped me. I already admired them. I followed them and they were, you know, very helpful with my research. And they were Africa, my Doleal, House Sounds, uh, uh, Aquatunes Sistema de Som and also Natividade Sistema Sonoro. House of Sounds and Natividade come from the extreme south area of the city of Sao Paulo and Africa Mando Leão and Aquatune are from the east zone of the city. And in the most recent uh, statistics, both of violence and inequality, these are the regions uh, in Sao Paulo which have the highest levels of inequality and violence. And in Brazil, we have Benegão, you know, a Brazilian musician who says that the sound system has the ability to dynamize, to empower absent freedom. He says that in his song, uh, Selectors of Frequencies. With something that is confirmed on the interviews, which are based on a specific methodology, that has brought us to some results as follows. The first is that the sound system collectives have articulated processes that involve the occupation, and the circulation of participants in new physical and symbolic territories, right? In other words, it makes these participants of the sound system go to, to move around other areas of the city, thereby increasing their experiences and world references. The second result that we found was that the sound system culture also has given the opportunity to expansion and diversification of social relations and identity changes linked to development of a critical repertoire about the reality. In other words, sound system culture has increased the networks and that makes it so that the selectors will try out other social roles. And from these exchanges, they start critically analyzing the reality. And uh, finally, and equally, the sound system culture has contributed to expand the technical and human skills of the participants occupying a central place in the daily lives of some of them. So from the involvement of culture, they end up creating the repertoire or abilities that they have, you know. They start to become teachers, articulate workshops, you know, approximate from technical issues of how to handle the technical part of the sound. So it increases their repertoire of abilities. These are results that indicate that the involvement with the sound system culture has made these young people who are above all social subjects to become more than this in a reference to Paulo Freire, finding spaces to express their demands in a very inventive way, affirming in public spaces their identities, languages, and values. Sound systems are thereby a very valuable resource in terms of producing changes in conditions which restrict experiences, the expression of identities, and the exercise of autonomy. And I normally say that the coolest of all of that is that this is not ha uh, this doesn't happen in an institutional space. It happens in the streets, showing that the care, uh, production of care, doesn't necessarily have to happen under the guise of the state or a health institution or whatever. And just to finalize, I was very careful with this research, and that's why it took so long to be printed. You know, it's about to be published. And uh, 
uh, academic papers, uh, uh, journals, because I really, it took me a while because I really talked to all of the protagonists of this movement and they helped me notice that I was not going to occupy their voice, but I was going to contribute with their culture with this research. And in addition to that, I didn't want to give them the impression that the sound system culture alone will solve all the problems of the territory, that it's enough, you know? as we understand culture as yet another device or another right, another to reach another discussion, another level of discussion. But it uh, should not be removed from the equation just because it does not solve the problems, you know? Young people seen as social problems and need opportunities to have the right to invent rights. This is a complex achievement for sure but one that certainly has been facilitated by the sound system culture. And finally, I have, I can say that I have very beautiful material from this research, you know, the interviews, but very nice, very beautiful, you know. You can do a lot with what the selectors and the selectresses told me, you know, it's a very rich material, but it's transversal. Uh, transversal to all the talks, you know, coming to all the talks, the selectors and selectresses mentioned the desire to move forward and the important feeling of feeling complete by means of the sound system culture, something that's very significant in context where these young people see themselves constantly interrupted and devalued. In Sao Paulo, it's, these are very important uh, uh, conversations, you know, and they say that in times of absence, it's essential for us to talk about the presence, you know, about what's going on to try to give some meaning to the way we live. And if the possibility is the movement of the world, then I believe that understanding the sound system culture as an instrument that is capable of resignifying lives and meaning seems to be a nice way to go. And I'd like to say, to talk, mention one of the talks of one of the selectors, there are many of them. But I believe this one is very representative from the Africa Mando Leon Collective. And I quote, just the mere fact of uh, you as a black member of the, out of the gate to, to be here is a thrilling fact. For example, my mom, my grandparents worked very hard on all of them the same way. So I always want to do my work with art with something I believe because somebody has suffered before I have. So in my mind, I don't have to suffer like they did. I have to take the next step. And for them, the next step has been possible from the sound system reggae culture. And this is it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit messy with the words, but it's really nice to be able to contribute with the discussion from my perspective uh, of sound system understood as a resource for emancipation for strengthening of subjects from the ghettos and territories in the city of Sao Paulo. And well, that's it. Thank you, Luisa, thank you very much. I'd just like to remind all of the participants that you can ask questions using the Q&A button, the Q&A button that's in the, on the bottom of the screen, okay? Now, the next presentation uh, will be given by Michel Brasil from the Federal University of Belo Horizonte, Why Sound System Connecting Hip Hop to Sound Systems. Michel, you have the floor, thank you. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Good, every, good morning, everyone uh, in Brazil, and good evening, good afternoon who, who, uh, for those in the Northern Hemisphere. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to talk. I'd like to uh, share my screen now and I'll uh, make a presentation on the topic. I hope you can visualize my screen. If you cannot, please let me know and uh, through the chat box. So like Leo said, presentation uh, is called Why Sound System? Connecting Hip Hop to Sound Systems. This uh, presentation was based on a research that I did about uh, local hip hop along the last years. And from between 2016 and now, this research has intensified due to my master's degree in arts 
at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, uh, my master's course in arts, and it's uh, 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 research based on the ethnographic methods and in con direct contact with the subject. Why some system? Is a sound system, and at the same time, it is a band from the city of Belo Horizonte in Brazil. It was founded in 2005, and it's made up by Bruno, Vivi, Cordão, who are the MCs, the vocalists of the band. Miss is the producer of uh, the sound system, and DJ Sean. They are the ones that are responsible for this uh, enterprise. And I'd, I'd like to bring this perspective of union between hip hop and the sound systems because they have this clear proposal. They work with uh, uh, the hip hop movement in the city for a long time, but also musically their proposal has more to do with reggae. The songs that they sing and that they play have a sound that sounds more like reggae, although they bring some elements of reggae in hip hop, have rap and hip hop. But however, in my opinion, they keep on being hip hop, and that's why it uh, brings about uh, the topic of the presentation this mixture of reggae, dance hall, and we can, uh, that we can see in the sound systems in the city. Reggae and hip hop have some connections that uh, have been addressed yesterday in the talk by Wayne Marshall. Uh, the presence of R&B records, American music from the 1950s that was played in, in the first sound systems, and then uh, the cool hurricane New York, one of the first uh, hip hop DJs that was uh, made one of the first parties in town. There were uh, two systems in the city. And also the use of technology, which is inherent to both cultures. The two musical styles have a strong connection with technology. Uh, even the sound systems, actually. And also the appropriation of reuse of existing material also is very present. Samples, parts of the songs, you know, in order to come up with the rap parts of, also the system culture is uh, very strong. To reuse the rhythm and the instrumental bass and make this connection, it's very strong, both in the uh, reggae and in the hip hop cultures. The strong presence of orality, spoken singing, is another very much present element in both uh, musical genres and, and respective cultures, right? And the context, the shared context of uh, their origin from black poor communities and large cities, uh, both in Jamaica and in the United States. So these are some uh, connection points between these cultures. Maybe there are more, but in spite of all of these connection points, I believe that there are no proposals for unions that are so clear. There are some artists that have uh, made some featuring, uh, featured on, on reggae records and, and vice versa, but I believe why some system has this proposal in their blood, you know, this union between hip hop and reggae music in the sound system. Sound system is also hip hop, right? Bruno says, uh, uh, you know, one of the members of the group, he says, well, sound system is hip hop. I'm from hip hop, Gordon is from hip hop, VV is from hip hop. We used to sing rap back in the late 1990s. And when I learned that if it were not for the sound systems, the first hip hop parties wouldn't have happened, I, I saw that everything was connected, you know? So for them, that's something natural, to be hip hop and to be sound system at the same time. That's something uh, for that for them are sister structures, you know? The way that how they can live through this connection so clearly. 
But then I'd like to point out how, by some system, uh, made that connection with hip hop. They maintained their roots in hip hop. It has to do with the sound of the group as a whole, but I believe it has more to do with the work and their dedication to uh, publicize knowledge uh, and the movement in the city. And I will mention some points in which they keep on being hip hop. One of these points is their, or, uh, the fact that they organize street parties. They frequently organize uh, parties at public spaces free of charge uh, and squares and schools on the streets and uh, mainly in uh, ghetto areas in poor neighborhoods and slums in the cities and they focus on that very clearly and Bruno also says when he talks about this strategic focus on uh, organizing street parties in the ghettos he says when we go out with the sound system here's what we do we promote entertainment at places where there isn't any we bring reggae music to ghetto areas where there isn't any music we always, we always focus on the ghetto and we always will. So sometimes they, they organize parties downtown, you know, in more accessible locations, but most of the parties that they organize are located in uh, uh, the outskirts of the city where people do not have access to entertainment or to reggae music. So they have this objective of publicizing, of uh, disseminating the reggae music in the city. Another aspect that I believe connects them to hip hop is the support to young artists that are just starting out their careers. You know, young rappers, young DJs, and other elements of hip hop as well, like young B boys and B girls and graffiti artists, you know? They always organize their events and open the space for people who are starting out, you know, to play their music or to perform. You know, there are another, uh, still, according to Bruno, he says, when I started to sing rap, there was no place to sing. Our idea is to make events for kids who have nowhere to sing. You know, kids who are starting to sing rap, rap groups that have nowhere to perform, and we like to make hip hop events. But all the elements are hip hop. Put on a rap show for people to see the rap show, watch the breakdance circle, the graffiti artist, and the DJ performing some songs, you know? He talks about this uh, issue of the four elements of the hip hop culture, you know, because most uh, rap parties, we see the, pres the, the, pres the performance of rap groups, you know, they always try to bring, you know, these four elements whenever possible, you know. We have to remember that hip hop is a culture that involves specific elements, and part of their mission, their job through hip hop is to open the space for other uh, artists that are starting out right now. This is a flyer of an event that they promoted, uh, the, the featuring several uh, well-known groups with several other artists, most of them, you know, just starting out artists from ghetto areas of the city. Another point that I consider a connection point with hip hop is uh, dissemination of knowledge, participation in the education process. The group members always act as uh, uh, teachers and workshops and, you know, either in social government uh, processes, but also in autonomous, by means of autonomous initiatives. So they always have rap workshops, DJ workshops, graffiti, you know, and that has a connect, a direct connection which what is connected hip hop, you know, the dissemination of knowledge, sharing of knowledge, which hip hop deems so important, all the members of this culture. You know, it's always uh, Africa Bambata started talking about that back in the day, which is still valid, you know, so I believe that this also connects them to hip hop because they played this institutional role of dissemination of information in the city. This photograph is a record of a workshop by Gordon who was teaching to these young people there. And finally, uh, the musical element that I believe that connects to rap and preserves a very strong connection to the hip hop culture is the use of the work and spoken word song of rapping 
which is one of the main vocal resources used by the band's vocalists. You know, they use the basses and the beats have a, 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 a big connection with reggae, dance hall and rap, but the performance, the performance of the vocalists is always, always supported on, on, on rapping, on the spoken word song that's similar to rap you know it's something that uh, we have in reggae music as well some systems etc you know djs and some subgenres such as raga they have a uh, a more a stronger presence of the spoken word song but that is central to rap and they maintain this connection yeah most of the songs is is wrapped you know i mean they uh, use this resource a lot, and I believe this resource is vital, and that connects to rapping and hip hop. And these are the elements that I believe that maintain their roots in the hip hop culture in the city. You know, uh, organizing street parties in the ghettos, supporting young artists, uh, uh, spoken word song, and their participation in educational projects, uh, dissemination of knowledge, right? I believe these are the points in which they clearly maintain their connection with the hip hop culture, but also disseminating the reggae culture uh, by means of their sound system and becoming a raga slash dance hall uh, band in the system. If you want to know us, uh, know why sound system more, just check out their uh, Facebook page, Instagram, and Spotify, YouTube. They have materials there. And finally, I'd like to leave my contact information here. If you want to know more and want to get in touch, please feel free to do so. I'd like to thank the organizers of SSO and everybody who is watching and participating. And I'd like to give a special thanks to the Y Sound System members for their attention. I'm thankful for that, for the support for this research. Uh, everyone, thank you very much. That wouldn't have been possible without them. Thank you very much. Okay, obrigado, Michel. Um, Thank you, about... Michel. Next presentation comes from Carla Freire from the Federal University of Maranhão, São Luís, Brazilian Jamaica, diaspora, reggae, and Maranhão identity. So I'll give the floor to Carla. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Gomboni. Can you hear me well? So, well, my name is Carla. I come from São Luís in Maranhão. I'm a journalist. Uh, my education, I, I got my education at the Federal University here in social communication, and I have a master's degree in social sciences from the Federal University here. And during this master's uh, uh, education, I developed uh, some of this research. Actually, this is part of it. I've been researching uh, this topic since 2007. That's when I started, and I've been researching several aspects of reggae music and reggae culture. Uh, I took a snapshot of my research for this presentation to you, and the title of my uh, presentation, São Joís, Brazilian Jamaica, is, which is a question, that's actually the question I asked myself back then, you know, a question that made me, you know, start researching this topic. Just like Luis, I started uh, going to reggae parties because I liked it. When I uh, joined the university, I started going to some reggae uh, places and I started noticing that reggae in San Luis was a different reggae music from the one that I knew since I was a kid. When I was a kid back in the 90s, the reggae uh, music was... Uh, 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 salon reggae, you know, where you had parties, you know, close to the beach, you know. Many people would go from uh, poorer classes. And uh, when I started going to college, middle class reggae music events, it was not the same thing, you know. So this is something that I noticed clearly and immediately. So, you know, the reggae music in San Luis, why are these places different? Why is the audience different? I thought reggae was one and the, and the same. So I was always asking myself, is St. Louis really the Brazilian Jamaican? 
we have several movements about like that in, in Brazil. We have that in Bahia, Paramina, Sao Paulo, but why is St. Louis considered or known as the Brazilian Jamaica? What is here that, what, what is there here that makes it so? And what does it mean for St. Louis to be the Brazilian Jamaica? So this is my research. It's based on ethnographic methodology, lots of interviews. I went to the field a lot. I went to several reggae uh, venues for many years. Uh, you can participate observation, interviewing people, collecting material from uh, the media vehicles as well. And what I noticed is that reggae got to St. Louis in the 1970s. Uh, early 1980s, uh, and the turnaround from the 70s to the 80s, and he, St. Louis is a city with a very large black population and with strong African roots. And here, reggae was uh, taken on because of a matter of taste. There was, at first, no notion of what reggae meant in terms of uh, Jamaica, but yet still, reggae was adopted as an entertainment option by the black communities, especially in the ghettos. People went uh, to the reggae events because they liked the, the music and they liked to dance to it, although most of them did not understand the lyrics because they're in English and people do not, do not speak English here. So why was reggae so much of a hit here? And this was one of the questions that many researchers asked themselves, and they start from that to try to understand this phenomenon. It is a phenomenon. It's a very important thing, reggae, in St. Louis. If you've come to St. Louis, certainly you have heard reggae here. As soon as you get here, listen to reggae, because it's all over the place in the city. So, how did reggae get here in the 1970s? Some researchers say that they, they came here because of sailors that came from the French Guiana and would land in the Itaqui or Cururupu ports and they would exchange their reggae records for food uh, in a kind of bartering system and these records started getting here this way. Another hypothesis which is quite accepted by many people is the figure of one person, uh, the Macedo DJ who would go to Riba Macedo, who would go to Pará and bring reggae records from Pará. Uh, that rhythm had already gotten to Pará along with other rhythms and Riba Macedo and, and would bring the records to San Luis and that's how it got here. Anyhow, what's important to see is that the reggae music that got here at that time in the 1970s, there were parties that would play merengue music, lambada, bolero, and in the middle of this party, in the intervals of more agitated sequences, people would play reggae and nobody would know reggae. They would call that slow music, you know. Reggae music was played by some DJs at this time that I, uh, I interviewed them. They say, well, you know, we would play a lambada, one merengue, one salsa, and then the, the, the dance floor would blow up and then to cool things down, we would play a reggae song, which was slower. You know, and why did reggae start being danced by couples in St. Louis? The main hypothesis is that this one, you know, that people were already dancing, you know, bolero, you know, which they danced close together. They would keep on doing that as they would dance reggae, you know, close together. That's why St. Louis is the only place, it's famous for being the only place where people dance, you know, close together, you know, really close together as they say here, and what kind of reggae music is this? You know, that people like here. It's not any kind of reggae, it's Jamaican reggae, old, old Jamaican reggae from the 60s and 70s. It's uh, reggae music that doesn't play in Jamaica anymore, and that's the kind of reggae music that is a hit here. Another interesting thing we can notice in this uh, St. Louis reggae movement is that reggae music got mixed up with the local culture. It's not a cultural element that came from abroad, which implied in the loss of regional traditions, you know? Uh, since we have an African ancestrality, our culture, popular, popular culture, Bumba Meu Boi and, and uh, 
and uh, the other cultural mo movements have an African root, just like reggae. So some musicians from here have been able to identify several similarities between reggae and our popular culture manifestations here from San Luis. Another interesting thing is that during my research, I noticed that just as reggae fans would go to their reggae parties in the, over the weekends, these people many times were part of groups of uh, Bumba Me Boya, Cango de Piola groups, uh, which, you know, you know, one thing did not uh, 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 eliminate the other. On the contrary, they would, you know, connect things. You have reggae and uh, the original San Luis cultures living side by side. Many times, in a not very agreeable way, some people complain sometimes. You have parties at uh, baptism of poor groups, you know, it's a tradition. They spend a whole night playing their drums. And then you have a reggae party next to them with loud music and sometimes bothers them. But most of the population who are there and are enjoying the boy party are also enjoying the reggae music from next door. So it's a relationship that's a bit of a conflict, but it's also a convergence, you know, it's both of them live uh, well together, not so well many times, but they live together. And that's what I'd like to point out here. Another interesting thing that we can notice is that reggae music in San Luis first uh, won the hearts of the black uh, youth uh, from the ghetto. It was not a top-down thing. It didn't come from the elite, from a cultural record industry that was an imposition on everyone. On the contrary, there was a large resistance of the elites, of the elites at first uh, against reggae here. And uh, where the youth of the ghetto really liked reggae music and found a way of entertainment in reggae due to an issue of taste, identification in which somehow uh, became a resistance against oppression. The elite was against it at first. We can see that in several articles published, especially in the 1990s, people connected to the Maranhão Academy of Letters have published artists complaining about reggae music of this Brazilian Jamaica, saying that that was an absurd for us to become a Brazilian Jamaica when we're a merely Brazilian, you know? So they would say that these elements came from abroad. Reggae is an imported culture, so coming from a puristic vision of culture, a pure culture, you know? So there was a certain campaign against the expansion of reggae music and the understanding Thing that reggae was part of the local culture of San Luis. And this was uh, eliminated along the years by the strength of the movement itself because reggae music parties spread like wildfire around town and with the support of the radiolas. And then we have to talk about the radiolas. What are they? They're inspired in the first sound systems from Jamaica, which were small clubs uh, which came uh, on cars uh, to curb the government control and uh, radiolas grew and we have today we have hundreds of radiolas in San Luis it's something that's so common that people have a radiola at home and they like parties for their neighbors in their streets and they have radios that have become companies, enterprises that make profits and are real companies that actually have employees and generate profit, lots of profits. We have some large radios here, they have large walls of sound, you know, that show in the national news, you know, there are icons of the San Luis reggae. And these radios are huge. And they're mobile, so they go everywhere. They go to the cities in uh, uh, anywhere in San Luis and they, they, in, in Maranhão, and they have parties all over the place. This kind of reggae music that is a hit here is uh, old Jamaican reggae music, you know? 
people here really like roots reggae, Jamaican reggae. You know, this a softer reggae that people can dance close to, you know? And we call that reggae roots. And for many years, these radiolas fed from the exclusiveness of these uh, reggaes. Several owners of uh, radiolas in Maranhão would travel. They traveled over 40 times to Jamaica and to London. It's crazy when we think about that. I interviewed Max Nation, Nati Nifeson, who's one of the main DJs here, is one of uh, Nati Nifeson and Radiola here. It's one of the people who have traveled over 40 years, times to Jamaica. And he really likes this exclusive reggae music. You know, what happens when they would go there and dig up the hits and they would scratch out uh, the label of the vinyl. They would call these uh, songs with their proper names from here, which are the Melo. I will still uh, uh, get to that part. I'll talk about the Melo culture. And this song would only play exclusively on their radio radiolas. And why was, uh, you know, what, what did this Melo thing come up? I don't know if you've heard about it. Melo is very famous here. It's a song, and well, since the population, the reggae fans cannot speak English here, well, these songs were rebaptized, you know, instead of using the original name in English, uh, they take a part of the song that sounds like something in Portuguese, you know, and the name of the Melo is very, uh, it's very interesting, you know. Uh, the Melo de Poliana, for example. Yeah, I'm just about to close. To pay homage to the daughter of a uh, 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 Hadiala owner. And uh, one of the songs says, what, what witch is going to get you? And it sounds like, look at the crab. So it's called the crab mellow. So mellows happen in two senses. One is to eliminate the possibility of authorship in order to maintain the exclusiveness of the song. And two, because people have a better identification. They identify better. Uh, White Witch is the, the name of the song. People don't know what that means, but they know what, what the crab mellow sounds like because it's the name of a, the crab. So what happens is that when these mellows become rarer and rarer, they start doing things differently. They start making recordings in San Luis. And these recordings are done in the studio here. At first, Jamaican singers would come here to record, and now uh, local uh, singers are recording now, and these are called Robozinho, or uh, robot, uh, little robot recording. It's uh, called that because of the type of recording which uh, emulates the whole band in the computer and also because of the way of dancing. It's not just like a couple's dancing close together, it's a robotic dance. And this reggae music is uh, enjoyed by the young black community this way uh, nowadays. And it has created a, a big discussion among the elder reggae fans who like roots reggae. I'm running out of time, but I'd like to close by saying that What's interesting about reggae in San Luis is that it's quite diverse. It's very diverse and people are so passionate about it that we have disputes, you know. I'm sorry, she's broken up. Um, people have disputes to say who uh, plays the best reggae, local bands or Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we're back, we're back now. Okay. So, there's a very strong uh, struggle between the agents that uh, are part of this productive chain of reggae music here. The bands that sing in Portuguese, that sing lyrics of resistance, the radiolas, the older movement, the fans of the radiolas, who are already divided into different tribes. Some people like Roots, Roots Reggae, Jamaican Reggae, some others like Little Robot Reggae music, which is produced locally. And what's interesting is that the dispute is 
quite strong, you know. You have fans that are fans of radiologists, you know. They fight among each other to see who's the best radiologist. You know, the DJs and the record collectors struggle to see who represents reggae the most in, in San Luis. And this is the most interesting thing, you know. My research has focused on this uh, fighting, which actually make this movement uh, happen, you know. It has its ups and downs, but it's always there, you know, renewing itself because the culture is dynamic and it's always modifying itself and the spirits will always be there. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. I'd like to remind you that you can uh, ask questions by using the Q&A uh, uh, button. Let's uh, go to the last presentation of today by Kawan Vasconcelos from the Rio de Janeiro Federal University. He's going to talk about the para uh, aparelhagens. I'd like to ask him to connect his microphone. With him variations in Encantaria or is there a Caboclo spirit dancing in Aparelhagem? Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the organiz organizers of the event and the opportunity to be able to talk about my research. Actually, I'm going to get away from the general topic of the discussion. I researched since 2016 in the Marajo Island in Pará on uh, African-based religions in the Amazon. Actually, this presentation is an attempt to make an experiment with the idea of anthropological translation from certain concepts which are closer to music, things that I heard in the island of Marajá. So this is a new text. I've been thinking about this now, so I'm going to share that with you. I'd like to ask you uh, to read it because it's an attempt, so I, I, have, I have prepared a presentation for today. Everything that came into existence was already there. It just hadn't been developed yet. These words were spoken to me by Manuel Hilario, Pajai Hilario, the indigenous shaman, in an attempt to make me understand how the relations between the two lines of work took place in his terrain, the courtyard in the municipality of Suri and the island of Marajó. The shaman works in the Linha do Fundo, or the bottom line, the native Brazilian practice of mobilizing the strength of the water spirits, is also a priest in the Mina and Umbanda religions. Maintaining both practices in his courtyard requires techniques that place the lines and their strengths within their limits and singularities. After all, he explains to me, the kabotos, the entities of the mind, and the kabonos of the bottom line have different rhythms. This presentation seeks to discuss this rhythm distinction presented by Hilario as an interesting factor for the ethnographic description and for the very reflection of the anthropology of religions of African origin and there are variations, uh, the Afro-Indigenous and Amazon variations. For this, I take the case at first anecdotal and try to extract from it the reflections that are connected to these three principles that I'll try to pursue in the wake of the Marajoara, thinking about the lines, rhythm, style, and variation. One of the reasons that guide these choices, choices is the attempt to escape the revisionist models generally used to understand such varied religious ex, uh, religious experiences, such as the syncretic perspective, where the differences gathered in these experiences are erased to give rise to a new type of unity, simulating the differences and returning to an amorphous whole where they are not recognizable in their singularities. This happens, I believe, due to the type of desire that involves such perspectives type of effort to find units of analysis, a domestication of variations by constant factors so that they serve discourses such as that of a national culture, its harmonic miscegenation, its egalitarian syncretism. Here, the option is to follow the differences, believing that divergence, the relational basis of these practices, is what allows the creativity of these pr practitioners and not a feeling to be circumvented or overcome. In a conversation with a pilot sent in his terrain in the municipality of Sori on the island of Marajó, we watched a video on a WhatsApp group that he shared with other priests in Maranhão. In the video, 
Tuka blokus, the enchanted spheres, were dancing to the rhythm of the Aparelave, a very polysemic word in the vocabulary of the Marajá people, which sometimes means the equipment used for the reproduction of electronic music, such as melody and techno bragger, sometimes used to designate the parties used with these uh, songs, and many times the set of different styles of this type of music. With a mixture of humor and disapproval, he explained to me that the video was giving people something to talk about. At first, the position that prevailed among the supporters was that it was not possible to judge what could be an attitude taken by the enchanted spirits who come to earth for celebrations and act upon the body of their mediums to drink, smoke, talk, sing, and of course, dance. The respect for the Kablokos and their attitude came first somehow. However, contrary opinions arose with the conversations that you told me. The main one is that there should be greater control of the situation, but ahead of the terrarium in question, wherever the thing happens. More control of the situation. The wishes of the Kabuktas are generally negotiable, and negotiating, shaping this relationship between the medium and the kaboko, the spirit, is the role not only of the medium, but mostly of the priest, the Mande Santo, Padre Santo, as religious leaders. There was also a third dimension that hovered in the group, one that people tried to avoid at first, that the mediums who were supposed to be acted upon by their kaboko's could be pretending. This is a reprehensible practice, but it's quite common in terrarius. The accusation, however, is very frowned upon by the supporters who may suggest it, but never point it out directly. Although, as the practitioners of the Marajota Hills have told me, everybody who has mediumship knows those who are pretending. So, my research in Marajó, these two lines of work with these forces, uh, known as the enchanted forces, that might be cabocos, which are normally considered spirits of sailors, uh, cowboys, indigenous people, and the Caruanas from the back line, who are a different type of people. They're normally birds, uh, uh, fish, snakes, etc. What's interesting is that the, the priests, the fathers and mothers of saints, are initiated as shamans for the other line as well also known as Peni Maracá or Pajalansa, normally known as Pajalansa. This is an interesting factor for the interesting uh, factor uh, for the studies of uh, African uh, religions, this identification, maintenance of the differences, of the different forces so that they will not lose their singularities between their contacts. This difference might be noticed by means of the different rhythms that the work in each line executed such uh, the Hilario Pajé told me. It's easy to uh, see the difference. In Caruana and Encantado, they affirm uh, they start the work with the lights low or in the dark, which, where they can get to the firmness of their secrets. In the mind, by Avento, all the way to the arrival of the Caboclo, everything happens with the lights up for everyone to see. And my research, research tried to accompany this rhythm movement between these two lines of work, you know, the practices in their uh, coat yards. What I believe is most admirable, I believe, in the practice of lines in Marajó is how these practitioners work from idea of variation that does not simply pass from one, go from one pole to the other. This idea in which two constants, the main line and the fund line, are arranged side by side and that the practice of going from one to the other is a kind of a detached act is somewhat unsatisfactory, I believe, to understand what happens in the enchantment of Marajá. With this idea, we try to stabilize these constants as if they were not, in fact, variations. The idea that comes closest to the experience of shamans and priests in Suri, I believe, is that of continuous variation, an expression used by Deleuze and Batari in the Batus which in turn extract from William Labov's study on Black English. The idea of continuous variation allows us to think that not only is the variation that is the baseline reference for the practice, but it also highlights that these passages that may or may not occur are movements and phases that require knowledge of how to do it, when you can do it, and when you cannot. 
variation between the two lines occurs in an approximate way. This idea of continuous variation with the very idea of turning, which is when the medium turns to his caboclo or caruana. In the case of caruanas, which come in chains, which, uh, you can count them. And the caboclos rarely come in uh, groups more than three. Turning is an art, a type of tuning in, in the musical sense, between the body and a force that takes on it. A type of relationship that is elaborated in the ritual process and in the medium experience in general. This tuning in is found even in the transformation of the mina beats in the relationship between the atabaki drum players, the abatazeres, as they're called here, and the caboclos. As my friends in Sori say, the rhythm of the beats has changed over time in a relationship of innovation that involves spirits and practitioners. On the caboclo side, the songs that they sang demanded a rhythm change from the atabazeros, the players. The beats that were previously known to be more paced started to be corrido, accelerated, and doubled. Because of this faster tempo in this case, usually only two drums are played during the party, as it's difficult to find three people who can play together at the same tempo. The transformation of the beats would require research and that investigation in this movement. Here we can only speculate within the idea of variation present in the relationship between the lines, that these changes are part of a type of creative evolution of these practices, and do not mean at first their dissolution and their disappearance. In the same way that written innovations must undergo testing processes in which the development is dependent on their effect and continuity, this way to think about the place attributed to music genres as the electronic sound of the aparelhagem in the ritual sound system uh, of the relationship that the Kabbalists can build with these genres is an issue, an issue that arises on a case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> uh, this experiment can be seen from its char pragmatic character. Pragmatic because it's still a type of practice that is based on the art of consequences, which requires care. And speculative because the same practice is imbued with the dimension of experimentation, which is lived and also tested. Just to finalize, we can think of the idea of rhythm variation between the different rhythms of enchantment and the practices that they involve by thinking of a musical example, such as jazz music, for example, as a way of understanding what goes on and the phenomena generally reduced to syncretism and models of conversion of differences. This example might initially seem a little unsuspected, but a careful look uh, at its history, its roots in the blues and other expressions of African diaspora experience, will make this idea gain more expressive outlines. We can also speculate that given the North American experience of the slaved American peoples as compared with the experience in the Brazilian territory, the powers carried by these peoples was realized in a different way. Here, where religion was not prohibited, as was there, Part of the African philosophy of creativity was developed in a relationship with forces, and there it, it seems to have been channeled through music. What happens is another type of practice that, given a common base that connects practitioners, uh, variations are performed, improvisations also, not in a restricted or impoverished way of this base model, but as the very creativity involved in this practice by those who are involved in it. The experience can be approximated to a syncope culture in the sense attributed by Luis Antonio Simos White Coat. Without falling into the intricacies of musical theory, it suffices to say that syncope is an unexpected change in rhythm caused by the prolongation of a note issued in a weak beat over a strong beat. In practice, syncope breaks with constancy, breaks the predictable sequence, and provides a feeling of emptiness that is soon filled in an unexpected way. If the adage of every case is a different case, is really taken seriously, as well as the tradition of soloists in jazz, the Mina Terreros, each priest is an artisan, a stylist, who double their religious heritage together with the forces that they mobilize to return uh, a variation to the word, something new. It's a type of improvisation that is not only collective, a simple repetition of a tradition which is easily reducible to folkloric thinking, nor a type of solo interpretation that falls into a type of individuality disconnected from its ties. The variation occurs between these movements continuously 
avoiding both reductions. Thus, saying whether the caboclo, caboclo can or cannot dance to the sound system music is completely outside of the intention of my research or of this text. A large part of the practices that involve dealing with enchanted and the caboclos are surrounded by risks, experiments, which set the limits within which protection practices are developed, and at the same time, borders are crossed in a way of potentializing the body. It would be the case of asking, like the old philosopher, what can a body do? Or, as is written in the great book on jazz, who can stop me? It is this reductionist impossibility of the powers of diaspora peoples that the activist, poet, and researcher Amidi Baraka spoke out. Destinations are melodic lines that can be changed. Destiny is not the arbitrary servant, and its counterpart does not happen, but redemptive freedom. Musical harmony between destiny and freedom is the expression of African philosophy, says Baraka, which reminds us that we know little about the limits of its unfoldings, given the incredible achievements of its spirit. This is what I had to say. Thank you, Kawa. Now we will move on to the questions. I don't know if we have much time, but we have some questions uh, in the question and a box. Uh, Luisa has a question for you from Liv Sovic. I'm going to read and call it translated into English. Good morning. For Luisa, a question that might be off topic of maybe different to the topic discussed. She talked about the Africa Mandolion Collective saying that the young people feel constantly interrupted and devalued. Uh, my, this idea of being interrupted is interesting to me. Can you explain more? Is the term current? Is it heard in other media? When is it used or any other information about it? David also asked me about it before, uh, asked a question before, but I'd like to start out by answering this one. It's not a concept of being a, an interrupted young person. Actually, this the first time I had any contact with, uh, with this topic, with this term, you know, this way of uh, naming the situation was an experience that I had in Sao Paulo when I uh, participated in a workshop in a service of uh, youngsters uh, who had conflicts with the law. And during these discussions that we had in this context, I ended up noticing that actually these young people are interrupted. You know, so it's not something that is conceptualized or is studied or an elaboration on that. There are no references on that. This was a way that I, I tried to name this condition, you know something that was, uh, was closer to my research, but the, the reference that I use in terms of reference was from Idel, the Grupo, also Grupo, and also Miriam Abramova. I believe they bring about some issues that are quite pertinent regarding the theme of young communities, especially in Brazil. But I cannot attribute this concept to anybody specifically because it was merely something that uh, a way that I found to name the, the the situation. I don't know if that is a good answer to your question. Thank you, Luisa. And now we have a question to Carla uh, for, by Germano de Souza. Good afternoon, Carla. My name is Germano de Souza. Thank you for your work. I read uh, where Reggae's Law the copy that you gave to Bernardo Lamparina to, from Fortaleza. I was late and I missed a bit when you talked about the original weight of dancing close together. In terms of dancing, how do you see the development of reggae in Maranhão? People talk a lot about this musical dimension, but I still don't know this work. Do you have, do you know if there's any academic interest in the reggae phenomenon in Maranhão? Can you point me to any work down this line? Thank you. I don't know any specific work on the dancing itself, you know, it's a very interesting topic. I thought about, you know, writing a paper on that because we have uh, reggae dance groups, we have reggae dance teachers, you know, and we also can observe that a long time. It's something I saw in my research, you know, 
we started in the 1980s with uh, people dancing to the reggae music uh, very close together, couples, you know, very slow music, pulsing rhythm, and people can dance together too. In a long time, you know, the, with the new recordings, uh, reggae became more accelerated. And with this acceleration, we can see a significant change in the dancing style, the robot uh, reggae style, you know. I did not uh, come up with this name. I heard this name from several people, several reggae studies. People are studying this term in a recurrent way. And I started asking, what is robot reggae? Uh, little robot reggae. Uh, it's the way of dancing, you know. It's danced sometimes in couples, but it's it's a more mechanical style of dancing. I identify a large similarity with uh, the way of dancing, the parade dance, you know, the aparelhagem type of dancing. And it's also danced uh, alone, you know. People dancing uh, in threes, you know, they're using the same steps. And why is it called little robot? It seems more mechanical, you know? People look like robots when they dance. So it's a very pertinent topic, actually, academically speaking. Uh, it would uh, be excellent uh, research, and I really do not know if anybody knows any specific work on that. I do not have any knowledge on specific academic work on the dancing. It's quite relevant and interesting, really. All right, thank you, Carla. Now a question to Kawa from Marcelo Vassain. Kawa's presentation was very interesting. I do not understand where he works exactly. Is it in the island of Marajó? Do these experiences of religiousness reflect their religion there? Is there an influence of this music and the youth action a sound system of Anything else? And I would like to add if the phenomena that you described of the Kabuku entity incorporating the spirit in the aparelhagem, does that happen normally or is it something exceptional? Thank you for the questions. And the, the field, you know, my field is the municipality of Soru in the island of Marajó in the north of Brazil. In regard to the religion there, this thing about the Mina drums and and the, the, the relationship with the Mina drums in Maranhão, actually this is an exp experiment that is, uh, you know, dated. People remember the time when there were only sh shamans, pajés in Marajó, especially in Sori and Saldaterra, which is the neighboring municipality, and they talk about the arrival and the start of the, the playing of the drums from the 1960s. So actually we do have this perspective of a sort of religious aspect proper to the island and the arrival of the religion, which is a religion from abroad. And, you know, my research has to do with this relationship because all of the uh, priests that play the drums and at perform the Mina rituals, they have to be initiated for the bottom line, for the Caruana line. And that's interesting because it's a sort of restriction <clears throat> to the development of the spiritual work. So somehow the innovation of the arrival of the Mina drums goes through this type of, uh, of uh, protection of the line that is pr prior to that. Now, in regard to the spaces, the, the, the coat yards have their sheds, you know, that this, that's where they play the drums. They call it double, right? The double written. Normally, it's an external area. People sit down, they circulate, they drink, they talk to people. You know, people consult with the cabotos at this point. But what happens is, I do not really know about the Maranhão experience, but from what I heard from people who Marajó, who exchange information with the Maranhão cult yards, it seems that the external areas normally uh, are, you know, that's where they play the, the songs that are played on the radio or aparelhagem songs. And what happens is during, normally this environment is a separate environment from the ritualistic environment. But what happens is that 
in Marajá, we don't have that, you know, actually. The only type of music is the music from the drums, actually, the Atabaki drums. And it seems that in the video that they were talking about in Maranhão, the Kabotos were dancing not only to the ritual music, but they were also dancing just as the young people in Maranhão would dance to the aparelhagem music, so that they were frowning upon, you know. In Marajó, normally, you do not see caboclos in aparelhagem parties. But normally, the caboclos might take people from their homes. And I've, I've seen caboclos sitting down at bars, sitting with people, but without being in a party situation. That might happen, you know? But there is this stereotype, and I asked them about the experience of caboclos going to aparelhagem parties. They say it's not common. And that's why this issue of the video from Maranhão that they were watching created some, a certain kind of tension in their way of thinking, you know? Thank you, Kawan. We also have a question to Michelle from David. You take white sound system as a band, just like a sound system. But do they play instruments as a band? A reggae band? An instrumental reggae band, or do they play over instrumental basses? That's a question from David, and also Bruno, also following up, also asks Michel. Maybe he should answer the question, but anyhow. What's the future of reggae music in Belo Horizonte, especially in the ghetto? Well, first, let's talk about David's question. The band is comprised of one DJ and three vocalists. Right, so they sing over pre-recorded basses and produced on the stu in the studio, right? Sometimes, in some shows, they have the participation of musicians who play guitar, bass, and percussion. But the main formation, the main structure of the band is quite hip-hop, actually, you know, a DJ and singers uh, with... Uh, record players, CDJs, and microphones. But the type of sound is, uh, has to do with dance hall, raga, and more recent uh, uh, types of reggae music, more electronic reggae music. And Bruno's question, who's one of the members of White Sound System? We were talking about this in person the other day, and of course, he can answer his question better than I can. Belo Horizonte is not a city in which reggae is very popular, you know. In the Brazilian context, it's not a city where reggae has a deep penetration. Many, like other cities, for example, in São Luís and São Paulo, uh, where there are a lot more people listening to and playing reggae. There are not many bands, not many parties, and some sound systems that resist in Belo Horizonte. Actually, because to uh, perform events in the streets in Belo Horizonte, it's a, a, a painful process, bureaucratic process. The city administration does not make our life easy here. So I believe that the structure of reggae in Belo Horizonte, especially in the ghetto, needs work of some system, just like why some system really, you know? Because in the outskirts of in the ghettos of Belo Horizonte, what we have seen is that rap itself, you know, young people have listened to it less, you know, there's a lot of penetration of funk carioca and pagode samba music, you know, and sertanejo, Brazilian country music. And also rap actually is dropping in the youngsters' preference and reggae, let alone reggae. You know, in the future, we have to have a lot of be resistant, you know, the musicians, the sound systems, etc. have to be resistant. We have to fight on, and it's difficult to see reggae growing in this kind of environment, but that's what it is. All right, thank you, Michelle. Now we have a... <clears throat> question from Moses for Carla. Thanks for the background on how reggae arrived in San Luis. There's so many parallels with my sound system culture research especially in the city of Monterrey, Mexico. I'm really interested in hearing, seeing the little robots reggae genre. What is it called again in Portuguese? 
so I can search on YouTube or Google. Moses, it's called Robozinho. I'm writing it down on the chat box. I was trying to find videos to show you, but I wasn't able to do it. Just to show you the difference, but uh, all you have to do is search for a Melo, etc., and you'll be able to find uh, traditional older videos, but you can find all different sorts of different types of Melos. And if you listen to the Melos, you can notice that uh, the recording is different, different, you know? The sounds are Jamaica, but they were recorded by a band, you know, you have a bass, real bass with the original sound. Now, the robo, little robo sound, robo, robozinho sound, it's not, you know, you can notice that this is reggae music that's recorded by computers, you know, I mean, it's, it's computer uh, uh, sampled music, you know, and you can notice that the, the songs are sung, uh, you know, uh, a bit carelessly, you know. I interviewed a vocalist of a band and he told me that uh, to him, Robo, Robo Zinho Hage, I asked him about what he thinks about it and he says, this is reggae music sang by, uh, uh, in very bad English, recorded with no care at roadside studios in San Luis. It's a big critic to that, but that shows the difference, you know. Robozin in general is something for the market, you know. It's done for people to just to, to, to uh, consume. It's more accelerated and it's recorded in a very careless manner, so to speak, you know. Complicated to say, well, look for this or that song because it's difficult to find it. Just look up Robozin. You can find it easily. There's a lot of stuff. If you write mellow, you see older mellow, classical mellow. But in that case, you can find something, especially if you type mellow radiola, right? That's about it. Thank you, Carla. I have another question from David to Louisa. I really like to know what you talked about, the power of the culture and the movements in Sao Paulo and the positive aspects of the creative energy of people that are often excluded from the dominant discourse. You highlighted the sound systems, how the sounds and natividade from the far south of Sao Paulo and I've come Mandalay on from the east. Can you tell us a bit more about the composition of these sounds? Who runs them? What style of reggae do they play? And what roles do they have in their communities? Thank you. That is a very important question. During my presentation, I didn't have time to talk about these details in depth, which are fundamental in order to understand the action of these uh, sound systems in the context of the life of these youngsters and their territories. <coughs> Excuse me, House Sounds is from Capão Redondo neighborhood in the south area of Sao Paulo. But before saying that, I, in a methodological note, all of the sound systems that I interviewed had several participants, several members, but I actually used as a methodological strategy, the strategy to interview only the selector or the selectress, which had the most functions in the sound system, in addition to playing and selecting the albums and the songs, would be responsible for disseminating information, running for editors, and in order to bring more elements to the discussion. But there's all and several members in these collectives but I always invited only one of the participants from each collective. House Sounds, like I said, comes from the South Area of Sao Paulo. It's a collective whose main members are two young persons from the South Area, from Sao Paulo, and they play roots music, Rubia Dub, but it's quite varied, you know, the, the type of music they play. 
into in the interview they say that you know it depends on how the audience reacts but they really prefer reggae roots really in their territory which is quite vulnerable in Sao Paulo you know quite well known and uh, Capão Redondo is known for being the territory a, a, a very violent territory and they have a very nice uh, approach they make their events generally on public parks uh, and people go there to, to skateboard or play soccer and they like to do those events on Sundays which is when uh, families can be at home in the ghettos there are more people uh, in the territory on Sundays so that's very nice to see because the events are always crowded with mothers and fathers and kids, everybody's there, you know, so it's always nice to see the territory always shows up and participates in the meetings that they promote in their territories. Africa, Mãe Leão, from the East Zone, have a longer path in Sao Paulo. They've been working for over 11 years uh, with the sound system. They come from the East Side. Currently, they're not. No, well, currently nobody's doing any events, right, because of the COVID situation in Brazil. But they had already for some time, you know, doing their events in other territories in the city, holding their events in other areas of the city, not only in the east side. So they're growing a lot, you know. They got together with other sound system collectors and they made up the earthquake terremoto team. And they bring lots of sound systems from all over Brazil to Sao Paulo to participate. It's very large, you know, it's a collective that ended up being able to potentialize the culture. They have a, uh, a, a preference for roots and staff, you know, uh, in their musical selection. It's very nice because although they are no longer working so closely with their events in the East Side, in their actions, they consider the people from the territory, you know, to help them with, you know, uh, all the work, you know, uh, around uh, the events, you know, driving, loading, and so it's a source of income for the territory. You know, they also deliver, make deliveries and use uh, motorcycle delivery uh, people. So, you know, it's the generating income for their community. It's, an, uh, it's a mixed community, Natividade, from the South area, it's a mixed com uh, com uh, collective they have men and women and they propose workshops in order to educate people who are interested in the culture in order to appropriate further aspects so the members of the natividade sound system they study a lot they do research in order to become teachers so they have workshops on how to handle the equipment of the sound system how to operate the equipment a uh, workshop for women so that they can become selectresses, you know, so they promote workshops and they have this educational side that's quite nice, you know, that gives back to to the community, the, the learning that they gather from the sound system culture. And also Maputo Sistema de Som, which is uh, two young black women from the East area because they made up the aqua tune by means of a culture editor for the state of Sao Paulo. And during the interviews, they told me uh, about how they uh, had to educate themselves in order to, you know, learn how to, to write editals, you know, and, and run for public money, for public funding, you know, to fund their sound system. So, you know, these are the results that I found in my research in terms of uh, that, uh, those practices have increased the repertoire of skills of these young people, you know, uh, to do things that they believed in, in terms of sound system. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question. Muito obrigado, yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much, very interesting. Leo, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. <coughs> Thank you, and now we have a question to all. We have about 10 minutes left, so 
I'd like to ask people to answer very briefly, but it's a question that's aimed at everyone. So please, uh, do the colleagues notice tensions between the culture of South systems and social movements? Did the interviews bring moments uh, that allow for uh, noticing distances and by me making policies uh, and I imagine that they're talking about social movements. How do you notice that? And do you notice that in the research that you do? Let's follow the order. Let's talk to Luis and then Carla and then Giselle. I think uh, my research has to do with using uh, use the culture of sound system to talk about the problems that each of the participants had go through in their territories to show that somehow to show what they're going through in their territories uh, in a critical uh, discussion and from the sound systems they are being able to denounce what they do not agree with in their territories so I believe since my research has to do with that a lot to do with that I believe this is the right way to understand some systems from now on as a tool, as an instrument for emancipation of these populations, because we cannot count on institutional uh, uh, government uh, support. So the power is in the hands of people who are seeing their territories in a different way. Of course, like I said in my presentation, uh, that won't solve the problem as a whole, but I believe it's part of the equation, you know? And I believe that, of course, totally, the sound system is a very legitimate instrument from the interviews that I had, both in my research and also by participating in the culture, you know, my own way, from my own place. I really noticed that they have used the sound system culture in order to Put their finger in other issues you know that have not been dealt with by institutionally so i believe yeah thank you Luisa. michelle please well in belo horizonte i do not see many tension between the work of the sound systems and more institutional movements uh, the sound system culture here is not a mass phenomenon here. So it doesn't have a commercial character. It has a character of resistance and dissemination of reggae music. But when specifically talk about why sound system, which I follow up more, uh, that has that is involved with the city hip hop, they have this character of uh, very strong questioning. And I know that the members of sound systems specifically participate in social, social movements here, especially movements uh, from the civil society, not necessarily political parties, but social movements, autonomous movements uh, created by the civil society. And they have a strong militance in the cultural realm, especially under the flag of hip hop. And for a uh, long time, they have had an involvement with their uh, ghetto and their territories, and they work strongly in their locations. And they also are always talking about resistance and social critic. But since Belo Horizonte, the sound system phenomenon is not something mar uh, uh, market related. Uh, I believe that they they use their practice to question the use of public spaces in the city. It's a place where the laws and the engagement of the uh, public administration do not foster uh, the, uh, the making of parties at public uh, locations. Sound systems on the streets is a pragmatic resistance, a practical resistance. But I don't see any tensions in this sense. It's a, an attempt to operate with criticism and resistance of the movements uh, from the civil society. Carla, please, thank you. 
<clears throat> this uh, topic is very complex in St. Louis. Let me try to answer in, in parts. Why is that? Because, like I said, the movement of reggae in St. Louis is not unique. It's quite diverse. So when you talk about reggae, you, you have to think about radiolas, which is one thing. You have uh, entrepreneurial radiolas, which are financially driven, market driven. You also have radiolas, which are not like that, which are ideological in nature, approximation with the black movement. <clears throat> you have the black movement, and you have the movement of the band. So we have several movements, and this relationship is tense. Some systems here, we can say that they have a direct relationship with social movements, with the black movement, namely. The radiologists here are actually accused of, of, of being mercadological and not attuned with the social movements. They're accused of being company-driven, corporate-driven. And here we see that the black culture has a very strong engagement. There are several groups. I think she's breaking up again. Fico aqui garotando um monte de gente negra ainda, né? E então, e você tem as bandas que tem música. You have bands who have protest songs and resistance songs. So you cannot say that everybody's going down the same direction. You know, the radiolas and the sound systems not always go down the path of the black social movements. The black movements have several problems with the radiolas, but also a long time this movement appropriated from the the reggae culture in order to, to get in tune with it. So it's a very complex situation. I don't know if I made myself clear. All right, Carla, thank you. Kawan, uh, please, uh, the last remarks in our, uh, on our today's session. Yeah, when we talk about my research on religion, in Pará, there is this uh, tense relationship with the Federation which is the representation of uh, an institutional representation of the of the of the yards of the cult yards and in order to think about this relationship of religion and music you know and politics i believe there are two dimensions in terms of what we understand as policies in order to understand the one has to do with a political doing of a resistance and a response. And in this sense, the Federation or any kind of uh, uh, institutional apparatus serves as a defense weapon. You're defending yourself. You need this apparatus in order to re answer to a certain pressure of public agencies, etc. And I believe that we have the dimension of uh, response resistance, but also mainly the idea of uh, resistance by principle, which has to do with music and the ex uh, religious experience. And it has to do with the diaspora culture, an issue of what to do, given in face of the violence of the movement that was slavery, you know, the trafficking of black people. And how do you respond to that? You're trying to, recreate the existential territory. So I believe there are two dimensions in this political uh, resistance, you know, there are two dimensions, the dimension of response, and in this sense, it's a weapon of defense, and also there's a resistance of principle, a creative practice, which has to do both with the religious experience and also with the expressions of music. So I believe that this is, and of course, the tension and the differences between these two types of resistance will always be there. But like I said, I believe the divergence is fundamental for the creation process and for the very maintenance of the differences here, uh, between these areas. I believe this dimension of uh, tension, of tension in generates things. And I think it's important because of that. And it's a classical distinction, you know, the issue of relationship of the Afro blocks in Salvador with, with MMU. So there was a tension there, but the tension has always moved towards something creative. There's always the outcomes have always been the response given was always had always this uh, creative character, both in terms of the policy of resistance as answer, as response, as, as in principle. 
You mean the unified black movement of Bahia, right there. Yeah. Okay, we're about to finish our session here. The last question as to you, Kawan. Is there a direct relationship with the Mina Caboclos and the Mina drums in Maranhão? No, that's this history, you know, in my research I make a quick presentation on the history. You know, when Pará was still called Grão Pará and it had this strong relationship with the state of Maranhão, these were regions that, you know, had the, the you know, the, the same types of uh, slave traffickers. So there's a very strong relationship between these two regions and also there's a very strong relationship between the Mina courtyards and Pará, between Pará and this region of the uh, Interland of Maranhão, many caboclos go to the Pará terreiros or courtyards and they say that they come from Cotó, from the area of the, uh, uh, of the uh, interior of the state of Maranhão. So there's this relationship. I wouldn't say that the origin is in Maranhão, but I believe there's a very strong relationship between the, the two religions and they talk among each other. There's a dialogue between the two of the, the, the two religions. Thank you, Kaon. Thank you to all of the participants today, everybody who came here, the people from the panel, I'd like to thank you and say that tomorrow, maybe we can speak about that, but tomorrow we'll have another panel with uh, foreign members. And also uh, in 15 minutes time, we'll have uh, the UW session 420, UW 420, San System from Sao Paulo. Uh, on our, uh, our Facebook page, Sound System International. David, take it away, yeah. please. Just to remind uh, the session tomorrow, same time, same place, is Continental Drift, Global Sound System Environments. And it's actually five presenters tomorrow. So it's quite a packed uh, panel. And it's going to be a panel presented in English, which of course will be translated into Portuguese by Claudel, our great translator. So thanks again, one and all. Thanks to these uh, panelists for these really intriguing and thought-provoking presentations. Thanks to all the questions that we received, very illuminating answers to those questions. And uh, Brian, do you just want to remind everybody how they can tune into the live streaming that's going in right across now? Oh, yes. Um, we really hope to see you all uh, um, connected to the Facebook live stream. Uh, today we're going to have the UW 420 Sistema de Som from Sao Paulo performing a bunch of um, exclusive tracks and remixes all in a live dub style. And uh, I'm supposing that the live is about to start anytime now. Uh, from the next uh, 10 minutes. So just tune in on the Sound System Outer National Facebook page if you didn't have done it yet and uh, enjoy the music. Yes, see you tomorrow.